Hello friends, welcome to EPG Pachala. I am Dr. Ajay Solkhe, presently working as Assistant Professor, University School of Management, Kurukshetra University, Kurukshetra, Haryana. In this module, we are going to discuss about the discipline. Upon completion of the module, the student should be able to understand the meaning, nature and the various connotations of discipline. The range of causes of indiscipline, the various available alternative approaches for managing indiscipline and the code of discipline in industry, what exactly discipline is. Now, discipline is modulation of human behavior for desired performance. It is defined as the consolidation, conserving and canalizing human synergy for organizational excellence. Discipline encourages employees to conform to the established norms of performance and observe organizational values and standards of behavior. It anchors the employee's behavior and checks them from frittering away. It provides cohesion and direction to the team and organization to move in tandem to achieve the goal. Definitions pertaining to the field of discipline. According to Webster's dictionary, it gives three basic meanings to the word discipline. The first being that of training that corrects, molds, strengthens or perfects. The second meaning is controlled, gained by enforcing obedience. The third one is punishment or chastisement. Discipline is a procedure that corrects or punishes a subordinate because a rule of procedure has been violated, as defined by Gary Dessler. According to Ryu and Bayars, discipline should be viewed as a condition within an organization whereby employees know what is expected of them in terms of the organization's rules, standards and policies and what the consequences are of infractions. Features The objective is orderly behavior. Orderly behavior is a group desire. Orderly behavior assists the attainment of organizational goals. When members behave appropriately as per rules, there is no need for disciplinary action. This is self-discipline. When some members violate the rules and regulations, punitive actions are needed to correct them. Punishment serves two purposes. First, to directly punish an individual for an offense. And secondly, to set an example for others not to violate the rules and regulations. And what are the common symptoms and causes of indiscipline? Indiscipline is reflected in many ways like absenteeism, disobedience, theft, bribe taking and giving, damaging machine and equipments, smoking, fighting, gambling, betting, sleeping, sexual harassment, assault and similar other instances. The major causes of indiscipline are communication as a barrier, unfair managerial practices, unfair disciplinary actions, stressful working conditions, non-availability of grievance redressal. Looking at the various approaches for managing discipline, we have three set of approaches. One is a positive approach, second is traditional approach and third is alternative approaches to manage indiscipline. Positive approach has two options, behavioral control and managerial control. Traditional approach is coming out with three frames of approaches. One is punitive approach, judicial approach, human relations approach. With respect to alternative approach, we have HRD approach, group dynamics approach, leadership approach and intervention skills. These are explained in subsequently. Positive approach. Discipline in the context of modern management process needs to be viewed as a behavioral control mechanism. The process of behavioral control, like other forms of control, is an important managerial function. Viewed in this context, the behavioral control mechanism entails a number of processes like formulation of goals objectives, setting of standards of performance, developing appropriate norms, actual performance and behavior, evaluation of performance or behavior in terms of standards of performance and norms, ascertaining the extent of deviation from standards of performance and norms, determining causes for deviation, initiating corrective measures which might include in addition to removing the causes of deviation, reformulation of goals, objectives, revision of standards of performance and modifications and or development of new norms. Viewed in this sense, 
several issues that are common to mechanisms of managerial control in organizations are of relevance. These are listed below. Very first is participation of employees in formulating goals objectives, setting standards of performance and developing appropriate norm. Second is psychological acceptance of the above by all employees. Third is agreement on the methods of evaluation and determination of deviation. Followed by a reduction of time lag between the occurrence of deviation and initiation of corrective mechanisms, early sensing, warning and detection system as a prerequisite. A movement away from reliance on external control to emphasis on developing internal control among employees so as to minimize the economic and psychological costs involved in policing functions. Lastly, output orientation, procedure or time orientation. Punitive approach. The traditional approach to dealing with problems of indiscipline tends to emphasize the coercive and punitive methods within the rational frame, legal framework. The underlying assumptions behind such an approach are that people need to be coerced or forced to conform to the norms of a group or organization, thereby necessitating policing functions on the part of the supervisory and managerial personnel. That punishment is necessary for correcting deviations and changing the behavior of people in a desirable direction. These assumptions are unrealistic as they are based on inadequate and superficial understanding of the complexities of human behavior. Coercion as a means of ensuring conformity ultimately leads to alienation and apathy on the part of the employees. They will conform to rules and regulation only to the extent to which they can safeguard their own interest rather than give their best. The threat of punishment induces people to direct their energy towards nullifying or removing the threat rather than correcting their own behavior. Judicial approach. The judicial approach has a serious limitation in dealing with the problems of indiscipline in a constructive manner. It is invariably resorted to as an after effect that is when the situation of indiscipline has already arisen. Thus, the corrective action creates a time lag between the occurrence of indisciplined behavior and the initiation of necessary action. Despite several limitations, however, this approach is quite frequently adopted in Indian industries. This indeed has advantages in the sense that it follows the law of natural justice and that it provides the offender every opportunity to state his or her side of the case. It is a well known fact that the judicial approach, disciplinary proceedings and the like are time consuming processes leading to unusual delays. There may be reluctance on the part of the disciplinary authority to get involved unnecessarily. Human relations approach. Due to the problems mentioned above, there is yet another school of thought which advocates a more humanistic approach to dealing with the problems of indiscipline. This approach is often labeled as a human relations approach where the emphasis is on establishing a healthy interpersonal relationship between the leader and the employees. The offending employees are treated as human beings and their total personality and behavior are taken into consideration. An attempt is made to probe deeper into the causes leading to acts of indiscipline. Even causes stemming from personal factors are considered to be of relevance. Corrective mechanisms involve being considerate to the employees and helping them to get over his personal difficulty by change of assignments, shift, etc. Punitive actions are avoided as much as possible. Alternative approaches to dealing with deviations. Development in behavioral science for the last three decades indicate a growing emphasis on and trend towards preventive and constructive approaches to dealing with the problems of indiscipline in organizations. In the 50s, Douglas McGregor, 1967, a leading behavioral scientist, dealt with the limitation of both judicial and human relations approach in greater detail. Instead, he advocated the use of what he called the hot stove rule. The hot stove rule. According to this rule, a sound disciplinary system in an organization should possess the following characteristics. Advanced warning, immediacy of action, consistency and impersonality. Like a hot stove, the sound disciplinary system must be capable of giving advanced warning to employees about the consequences of non-conformity to certain norms and rules of the organization. If the rules and penalties are clear and well understood, a violation can produce some natural consequences. Furthermore, just as in 
case of hot stove, the penalty for violation should be immediate and automatic. The hot stove burns all the fingers or limbs touching it in the same manner. Likewise, a high degree of consistency is yet another characteristics of a sound disciplinary system. Impersonality needs to be maintained by keeping away subjective or personal feelings. Human resource development approach. Yet another approach of relatively recent origin in managerial discipline may be called the human resource development model. The emphasis in this approach is to treat employees as the most important resource in an organization. Through a system of appropriate training and education, multi-pronged motivational strategies, proper job allocation, etc., the efficiency level of employees can be raised and their commitment to the organization goals enhanced. Viewed in this context, the causes of indiscipline among employees are inadequate and inappropriate training, motivation system and personal, personal policies as perceived and interpreted by employees individually or collectively. In this approach, the penalty imposed is for a particular action or behavior and not the total personality. The punishment is more in the nature of a reminder to an employee that as a human being, she has several options whereby she can avoid such behavior which he is neither desirable for her or him nor the organization. The basic aim is to correct and to learn not to penalize. Group Dynamics Approach there has been a growing tendency to use groups as effective instruments in dealing with problems of indiscipline and deviations. Groups, both formal and informal, have tremendous influence on their members and demand a very high degree of conformity to certain central norms as a price of retaining membership of a group. It is a well-known fact that peer group influence plays a greater role in controlling one's behavior and in learning the different modes of behavior. Reference groups likewise act as catalysts for employees to emulate the norms and behavior of those groups. Thus, if organizational norms are accepted by groups, formal and informal, in an organization, the task of maintaining conformity to those norms can be left to the group. This is likely to be more effective than managements or formal leaders trying to control adherence to norms from a distance and by imposing occasional penalties. Several examples are available where work groups have successfully and effectively developed norms of absenteeism and of helping relationships and have adhered to those. The pride and prestige attached to a group are powerful means by which members can adhere to the norms of that group as their attraction to the group is high and they will not like to lose it membership. Leadership approach. Leadership as a process of influencing employees to act and behave in a manner conducive to achieve organizational goals and in accordance with the norms laid down plays an important role in strengthening a culture of positive and constructive discipline in an organization. Every manager or supervisor, regardless of the position he or she occupies in the hierarchy of an organization plays a very constructive leadership role in shaping and directing the behavior of his or her subordinates. And therefore, he or she is directly responsible for maintaining high standards of discipline among his or her people. The leadership style based on mutuality of interaction, persuasion, healthy interpersonal relationships and participation and involvement of employees in norm setting processes is more conducive to ensure conformity to the norms and generating commitment to organization policies and objectives. Intervention skills. A culture of work commitment and positive attitudes to the organization as a whole needs to be developed by providing opportunities to people to learn to be autonomous, responsible, self-directing, self-controlling and self-disciplining in their respective workplaces and organizational life. Various approaches have been tried out in different organizations to achieve the above. Some of these are work design and job enrichment programs. In the redesign of the work system, a group of employees not only collaborate in setting and achieving targets, but also develop norms of absenteeism and codes of conduct and ensure adherence to such norms by group members. 
The basic idea is to provide opportunities for satisfaction of the higher level needs of employees on the job so as to enable them to experience the satisfaction of these needs in the process of participation in the organizational life. Behavior modification techniques with emphasis on positive reinforcement have also been used to help employees learn the new desirable behavior and strengthen the norm-based behavior in the context of organization. Developmental counseling and group therapy provide other approaches to deal with problems of deviant behavior. What are the purposes and objectives of the disciplinary action? Following are some of the purposes and objectives of disciplinary action. To enforce the rules and regulation, to punish the offender, to serve as an example for others to strictly follow rules, to ensure the smooth running of the organization, to increase working efficiency, to maintain industrial peace, to improve working relations and tolerance, to develop a working culture which improves performance. Disciplinary actions. Despite the efforts made by the management to develop a culture of positive discipline, there could still be a few employees who may not conform to the norms and standards of behavior, the rules and regulations and the policies of the organization. In such cases, disciplinary action has to be administered. The Industrial Employment Standing Orders Act 1946 requires all the industrial establishment of 100 or more workers to define their service rules and prepare standing orders which should also include the procedures for disciplinary action. In the absence of its own standing orders, the company has to follow the model standing orders. The model standing orders spell out specifically the terms and conditions governing day-to-day employer-employee relationships. It is the duty of the employer to make the provisions of standing orders known to the employees. The employees in turn are required to comply with these provisions. Failure to do so could result in a charge of misconduct. Thus, the standing orders provide the very basis for the management to initiate disciplinary action against employees in an organization. Misconduct The model standing orders also contain provisions for disciplinary actions for misconduct. Misconduct on the part of an employee includes such acts like willful insubordination or disobedience to any lawful and reasonable order of the superior, theft, fraud, dishonesty, in connection with the employer's business or property and the like. Any action or behavior can be defined as misconduct if it adversely affects the interest of the industrial establishment or if it is prejudicial to the interest of the other employees. Domestic Inquiry The first step is to find out through preliminary investigation whether a prima facie case for misconduct against an employee is evident. The next step is to conduct a domestic inquiry into the allegation of misconduct within the organization. Principle of natural justice must be followed in conducting the inquiry, which would mean that no person shall be the judge in his or her own cause or be condemned unheard. In the context of domestic inquiry, these principles have the meaning and certain implications also. Very first is the inquiry against the employee must be fair and conducted by an impartial person. The burden of proof lies on the plaintiff or the complainant. The charge sheeted worker has the right to present such witnesses on whom he has faith. The charge sheeted worker has the right to cross-examine the management evidence. The evidence of the management should be taken in his or her presence. No material should be used against him or her without giving him or her an opportunity to explain. The inquiry officer should not import his or her personal knowledge, if any. The job of the inquiry officer is to bring the truth to the surface, not to prove the charge. The inquiry officer should not determine any matter without hearing both sides. He or she should not judge too hastily. The inquiry officer should base his or her findings beyond reasonable doubt and give benefit of doubt to the charge sheeted worker such that it works to the advantage of the charge sheeted worker in so far as the inquiry officer supposes him or her innocent rather than guilty. The punishment awarded should not be out of the proportion to the misconduct committed. It would be wrong to impose more than one punishment for any given misconduct. It is equally illegal to punish a person twice for the same misconduct. Punishment Various forms of punishment for different types of misconducts and their gravity are often specified in the standing orders of those organizations where the Industrial Employment Standing Orders Act is applicable. 
the punishment in those cases can be awarded according to the specification of the standing orders. Some of the penalties available are as follows. With respect to categorization, there are two kind of categorizations in punishments. One is minor punishment, another is severe penalties. With respect to minor punishments, the four punishments are accorded. One is warning or censure, fine with holding of increments and fourthly demotion to a lower grade. With respect to severe penalties, suspension, discharge, discharge this would be on grounds such as medical fitness, dismissal this is for some act of misconduct established in domestic inquiry, suspension pending inquiry. If the charges against an employee are of serious nature, the employer may suspend the delinquent employee pending inquiry. This power has to be exercised with circumspection, care and much thought and should be used only when prima facie there exist grave and compelling circumstances which in the light of the material available and collected during the preliminary investigation would lead to the likelihood of removal or dismissal of the employee from the services. Section 10A was inserted in the Industrial Employment Standing Orders Act 1946 to provide for subsistence allowance to workers during the period of suspension pending disciplinary proceedings against him or her. At the rate of 50% of the wages which the worker was entitled to immediately preceding the date of such suspension for the first 90 days of suspension. At the rate of 75% of such wages for the remaining period of suspension if the delay in the completion of disciplinary proceedings against such worker is not directly attributable to the contract of such worker. The power to modify or set aside severe punishment such as dismissal. The 1971 Amendment Act, Section 11A of the Industrial Dispute Act 1947 has made provisions for industrial disputes relating to the discharge or dismissal of a worker to be referred to a labor court, tribunal or national tribunal for adjudication. In case the court of the adjudication proceedings is satisfied that the order of dismissal or discharge was not justified, it may set aside the order of discharge or dismissal and direct reinstatement of the worker on such terms and conditions as it thinks fit or give other relief to the worker including the award of any lesser punishment in lieu of discharge or dismissal. Code of Discipline in Industry 1958 To maintain discipline in industry both in public and private sector, there has to be a just recognition by employers and workers of the rights and liabilities of either party as defined by the laws and the agreements, including bipartite and tripartite agreements arrived at all levels from time to time, and a proper and willing discharge by either party of its obligation consequent on such recognition. The central and state governments on their part will emerge to examine and set right any shortcomings in the machinery they constitute for the administration of labor laws and ensure better discipline in industry. Management and union agree that no unilateral action should be taken in connection with any industrial matter and that disputes should be settled at the appropriate level. That the existing machinery for settlement of disputes should be utilized with the utmost expedition. That there should be no strike or lockout without notice. That affirming their faith in democratic principles they bind themselves to settle all future differences, disputes and grievances by mutual negotiation, conciliation and voluntary arbitration, that neither party will have recourse to coercion, intimidation, victimization, go slow, that they will avoid litigation, sit down or stay in strikes and lockouts, that they will promote constructive cooperation between their representatives at all levels and between workers themselves and abide by the spirit of agreements mutually entered into that they will establish upon a mutually agreed basis a grievances procedure which will ensure a speedy and full investigation leading to settlement and that they will abide by various stages in the grievance procedure and take no arbitrary action which would bypass this procedure and that they will educate the management, personnel and workers regarding their obligations to each other. Management also agree to certain things. Management agree not to increase workload unless agreed upon or settled otherwise. Not to support 
or encourage any unfair labor practice such as interference with the rights of employees to enroll or continue as union members discrimination restraint coercion against any employee because of recognized activity of trade unions and c victimization of any employee and abuse of authority in any form to take prompt action for settlement of grievances and implementation of settlements awards decisions and orders to display in conspicuous places in the undertaking the provisions of this code in the local language to distinguish between actions justifying immediate discharge and those who were discharged must be preceded by a warning reprimand suspension or some other form of disciplinary action and to arrange that all such disciplinary action should be subject to an appeal through normal grievance procedure to take appropriate disciplinary action against its officers and members in cases where inquiries reveal that they were responsible for precipitate action by workers leading to indiscipline and to recognize the union in accordance with the criteria evolved at the 16th session of the indian labor conference held in may 1958 union also agree to certain things union agree not to engage in any form of physical duress not to permit demonstrations which are not peaceful and not to permit rowdyism in demonstration that their members will not engage or cause other employees to engage in any union activity during working hours unless as provided by the law agreement or practice to discourage unfair labor practices such as negligent of duty careless operation damage to property interference with or disturbance to normal work insubordination to take prompt action to implement awards agreements settlements and decision to display in conspicuous places in the union offices the provisions of this code in the local language and to express disapproval and to take appropriate action against office bearers and members for indulging in action against the spirit of this code friends i hope your doubts relating to the topic of discipline are cleared you can also refer to other quadrants of this module for testing your knowledge and having some more input on theme of the module happy learning